The SMG60. The ultimate paintball machine gun. The finest and most reliable in the world. Manufactured by Tipman Pneumatics Incorporated. The following presentation is designed to familiarize you with our company and its key people and how the gun is assembled. Also to show you a few troubleshooting techniques should you ever have a problem. Tipman Pneumatics Incorporated headquarters is located in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was formerly known as Tipman Arms. Tipman Pneumatics president, Dennis Tipman, is a pioneer in the development of the SMG60 first and only fully automatic, pneumatically operated paintball gun, which is designed as the ultimate gun for paintball games. Should you ever need to contact Tipman Pneumatics, you're likely to talk first with Judy Dafford. You'll find her courteous, efficient, and helpful. Our manager, Jim Miller, keeps the ball rolling in our assembly operations and can help you with any technical questions. Dennis McConaughey is another of our key people who mans the computer and keeps business in order. In an effort to help you understand the SMG60 and its operation, this first section is designed to show you how the gun is manufactured. The gun receiver is sandcast from Almag, a very tough aluminum alloy. Then it is descaled by aggregate blasting to give it a satin finish. Then it's on to the machining center, where over 30 machining operations are performed. The receiver is then anodized black for appearance. It's then ready for assembly. First, the barrel is pressed into the receiver. A permanent Loctite adhesive is used. It can then only be removed with heat. I'm Dennis Tipman. Here's how the guns are assembled. Uh, first, I'm going to mount the gun so I can work on it in vice. We have to clean the oxidation, the black oxide off the barrel so that the adhesive will stick. Now I'm going to apply some uh, adhesive activator to both parts. Then the uh, adhesive is applied. This is a Loctite adhesive. It's very durable. We very seldom have a grip come off unless it's a uh, heavy abuse. It also acts very fast. It is put in place, clamped, and in approximately 60 seconds, it is uh, adhered to the gun. It does take approximately uh, 24 hours for full cure, but uh, as this is curing, or as it's setting, we'll put on the other grip. It's held on with a quarter-inch Allen bolt. 
the grips are original M16 grips, extremely durable and very comfortable to use. Also included in the first operation, the uh, sling is attached and uh, this is the last of the first operations. From here it goes into the trigger and sear installation and then the valves. These slings are uh, adjustable, extremely durable. They're made of uh, all the parts of it are nylon and steel, no plastic fittings. And that's the end of the first operation. This next step is uh, installing the valve, the gun valve. Uh, first, I'll check and make sure it fits the gun. Yes, it does. We'll install the gas line. This is a 2,500 pound gas line. Slip it in from the rear end of the gun where the tank is in inserted. First we put on the ferrule, our compression fitting. Then we put on the threaded compression fitting. It is then inserted into the back of the gun and tightened in with a screwdriver until it compresses the fitting onto the tubing or the gas line. Then we uh, put this stainless steel spring over the gas line tube. The purpose of the stainless steel spring is it doubles the strength of the gas line. Uh, next, we connect the gas line to the gun valve. First, by putting on the, nut, the hex nut, then putting on the second compression fitting, then fixing it to the gun valve. Then we tighten the hex head on the compression fitting and uh, it's to be tightened one full turn, not more than one full turn or you're liable to get, compress the gas line to the point where it will not uh, allow the gas to pass through it. Also, the hex must line up straight up and down to fit into the, the gun assembly. There, the gas line and valve is installed. The third part of the assembly operation is the trigger and sear. First, we'll put in the trigger. We put the trigger spring right in the top of the trigger with the short side towards the rear, lower it into the gun receiver. alongside the gas line. Second, we put a pin through here to align everything, the hole through the trigger and in the, sp and in the spring. Next, just push the dowel pin, pound the dowel pin through. And the trigger is installed. Next comes the sear spring pin. I'm gonna put it halfway through the gun so we can hook the pin, hook the spring onto it. Then we put on the spring. This is the sear spring. The easiest way to get them in there is with a pair of needle nose pliers because uh, it's kinda tight down in here. I slip the spring over the end of the pin that I started through and pound the pin into place. Next we start with the sear pin and we'll start it halfway into the hole so we can uh, have it in place when we install the sear. Then we grab the sear spring again with the needle nose pliers and hook the little hook on the bottom of the sear through the first loop on the spring. And we set the sear, the front of the sear on the top of the trigger and tap the pivot pin through.
Now your trigger and sear is installed. The fourth part of the uh, assembly operation is the receiver tube and bolt assembly. First we install the receiver tube with the receiver tube or with the bolt handle notch to the left. Slide it directly in from the rear, lining the bottom of the receiver tube up with this rivet, which keeps it from rotating. Next, we insert the bolt with the bent, this is called the bent, down, which the sear hook's on. Shove it in. You have to pull the trigger to get it to line up with the bolt handle hole. This is the bolt handle. Notice the hole through the bolt handle. We insert it with the hole running horizontal. Then we put in the bolt drive spring, which is on the bolt drive spring pin. Inserting it right into the center of the back of the bolt, lining up the bolt handle to make sure that it goes through the bolt handle. Holding it sideways with my thumb, we install the receiver end cap. Threading it in by hand. And just slightly tighten it with a wrench. As long as this, so that the receiver tube does not move in any direction. Next, we put a piece of lead in the set screw hole so that it will not damage the threads. Then we put in the receiver end cap set screw. The receiver end cap set screw keeps the end cap from vibrating loose. Now your bolt assembly is installed. With the set screw tightened, the receiver tube and bolt assembly operation is complete. The fifth operation is installing the clip latch. This is the clip latch installed in the gun receiver. They're all installed against a gauge block individually for each gun. They have to be extremely accurate so that the balls line up with the barrel. First I'm tightening in the gauge block. Then the latch is put in against the gauge block and held in place. Then tapped with a center punch for perfect alignment. Then removed. And now I'll drill the hole in the clip latch. With the clip latch drilled, it's ready to install. First I'll remove the gauge block. Position the spring in the back of the latch and insert it into the gun and line the hole up from the top and install the pivot pin. There your clip latch is installed. The sixth and final operation is to install the magazine. Insert the magazine bolt. And first you insert the spring onto this bolt. Like that. Next, you just merely screw it right straight onto the gun. Tighten it down hard with an Allen wrench. And install the magazine end cap, which is just friction held on so that it can be removed to clean the magazine. There the SMG60 is completely assembled. With the gun completely ready to uh, test fire, we'll dry fire it here in the assembly room 
and then go to the uh, test facilities. Okay, the last and uh, final operation of the assembly is the test firing. And each gun is fired a minimum of 30 rounds. They're tested for accuracy, velocity, and uh, to make sure that they don't break any balls. We fire them at approximately 100 feet, because that's where the guns are sighted in for. This portion of the film is to explain exactly how the SMG-60 works. As you would receive an SMG-60 from the box, you would twist the 7-ounce CO2 cylinder into the rear of the receiver. While twisting it in, it does nothing until you reach the final turn. On the final turn of installing the CO2, 7 ounce CO2 cylinder into the receiver, it depresses the valve in the end of the cylinder, which opens the valve into the gun valve system. Right here as the, val as the cylinder is twisted on, the needle valve in the front of the CO2 cylinder is forced rearward, opening the valve, allowing the gas to pass around the valve and into the gun system. The gas travels through the gun gas line, the internal gun gas line, to the gun valve. The pressure of the CO2 gas at approximately 800 to 1,000 pounds automatically forces these valves shut. As the uh, gun is fired, if you, when you put, twist on the cylinder, the gun is in the safe position. To fire the gun, merely cock the gun for the first time and the gun is ready to shoot, either semi-automatic or full automatic. To pull the trigger halfway, we'll fire the gun semi-automatic. Pull the trigger fully, depress the trigger, we'll fire the gun full automatic. Here's how the trigger system works. As the bolt is cocked to the rearward position to engage the, the rear part of the sear, the front edge of the sear sits on top of the trigger. The trigger has two steps on it, the upper step and the lower step. The upper step fires the gun in the semi-automatic position. The lower step will fire the gun in the full automatic position. As the trigger is pulled, the sear is disengaged from the bolt and the bolt travels forward. At the same time, the sear moved rearward by the sear spring in the slotted pivot pin hole and allows the sear to drop down to the second step. At this point, the gun, that's the semi-automatic position, the gun would automatically recock without moving the trigger. If the trigger is fully depressed and the sear setting on the lower step, we'll fire the gun in full automatic and allow it to 
accelerate in the full automatic position continuously. To make a gun shoot semi-automatic only, if this second step on the trigger or the rear lug of the trigger is cut off, the gun will shoot semi-automatic only, whereas the trigger will drop down to and not hit the second step and go into this semi-automatic mode automatically. Also, we put a set screw in the rear, lower rear portion of the trigger guard, which can be adjusted out so that the gun will only shoot semi-automatic only. This screw right now is in the full automatic position, allowing it to shoot full automatic. Now, as the bolt travels forward, it hits the rear plunger in the double gun valve system. This gun valve has a valve on the forward portion of it and the rear portion. As the bolt strikes the rear valve, opening the valve allows the gas to go around the hex plunger. The gas pressure coming out around the hex at approximately 800 to 1,000 pounds pressure has sufficient energy to force the bolt in the rearward position to be recocked or cycle full automatically. As the bolt is brought to the rear position, or as the bolt is being pushed to the rear position, at the same time, the gun valve is moving forward approximately one eighth of an inch from the pressure at the rear face of the valve. As the valve moves forward, it automatically opens the front valve and allowing the gas again to go around the hex and out of the valve through the ports above and below the clip latch at the back of the paintball. Now here you can see the gas port where the gas comes in above and below the clip latch and hitting the back of the paintball. As the gas pressure increases on the back of the paintball, the paintball starts to move forward. At the same time, as the paintball is moving forward, the latch on the, the clip latch is forced by the pressure rearward, allowing the clip to index one shot. As this ball is traveling towards your target, the next ball is automatically already positioned for the next firing position. This portion of the program would talk about maintaining the gun. First of all, I start off with loading the stripper clips. <clears throat> As you can see, the strip, the balls do not fit into the stripper clips loosely. They must be pressed in and they friction hold into the stripper clips. Now, should a ball be loose, they can be turned and they will lock in place to where they will not fall out of the stripper clips. <clears throat> when loading the gun, stick the stripper clips into the gun and you can put three clips in here and it'll fire 15 rounds. Also, with the 20 round magazines, they'll fire 20. As you're firing the gun, <clears throat> should a ball break either in the chamber or in the barrel, which happens very seldom with this here model gun, uh, to clean the barrel, if the just merely push the stripper clip back one notch so that it's accessible for the cleaning cable. The cleaning cable has a ball end and a squeegee end. To insert the ball end through the barrel, putting the squeegee into the rear end of the barrel and then sliding it out will clean the barrel spotless clean. Now should you not have any stripper clips in your gun, if you just put, to put your finger into the chamber area and push the spring back and hook it on the latch to get the drive spring out of the way, then you can re do just the same thing with a completely empty gun to clean the barrel. This was developed, this cleaning system was developed for the SMG60 and works very efficiently to clean the barrel completely dry and clean. With the other standard paintball guns, they're cleaned from the muzzle end of the barrel and force the paint back into the mechanism, which causes a lot of problem. <clears throat> Next, we'll go into uh, maintaining the gun. To maintain this gun, it has to be kept very clean and 
dry and keep the barrel clean and dry and keep the other parts clean and oiled. A dry barrel shoots better than uh, any other barrel. The magazine must be kept clean. That's why this end cap on the gun is removable so that it can be cleaned from this, this end or you can take the magazine completely off with one Allen bolt and the Allen wrench comes with your gun <clears throat> And all you have to do is insert the Allen wrench into the bolt underneath the magazine and loosen it up, take the magazine off, and clean the magazine out. Should you get dirt and crud in there, it causes the stripper clips to feed poorly, which will cause the gun to malfunction and even break balls. But a clean magazine, there's never any problem. Now to clean and oil the rest of the gun, you can keep the receiver tube, the inside of the receiver tube, well lubricated so that the O-ring on the front of the bolt can slide freely with no friction of rubber against bare steel. Also, by inserting some oil in the receiver tube with the bolt in the cocked position, it also automatically oils the triggers and sears. Now, should you have to do any internal maintenance on the gun, this gun is very easy to disassemble to get at all the mechanical parts. With a 5 8 inch wrench, or a crescent wrench, <clears throat> just remove the rear cap on the receiver, which is the receiver end cap. Now the receiver end cap is under spring pressure, so be careful that the drive spring don't pop out <clears throat> as you're removing it. This is the receiver end cap. This is the bolt drive spring and the bolt drive spring rod. Now to remove the receiver tube and the bolt, just cock the bolt to the rear position and slide out the bolt handle. Slide the bolt out of the rear of the gun and also slide out the receiver tube. There you, with the receiver tube removed, you can get at all the mechanical parts of the gun. The gun valve, the internal reinforced gas line, the sear, the sear, and the trigger. Very seldom do you have to work on these here parts, but should you ever have to replace a sear or a valve, all you have to do is remove the receiver tube to get at them. To completely remove the sear and the trigger and the valve, they are held in with these three pins. This pin holds the sear in, this pin holds the trigger in, and this pin holds the valve in. And as mentioned previously, when we were assembling a gun, uh, you can see they could just be pounded out with a 1 8 inch punch, and they're held in there by friction. As you remove this here pin right here, the valve can be completely removed. To reassemble the gun, First, we'll install the receiver tube, depress the sear, and install the receiver tube in the full position. Next, you install the bolt with the sear notch downward until the bolt ha handle hole lies up, lines up with the receiver tube hole. Then you install the bolt handle. You'll notice there's a hole through the bolt handle, which the drive spring and drive spring rod must go through. <clears throat> to, ins to install the bolt handle, the bolt drive spring, leave the gun in the cocked position. Then with the drive spring rod in the spring, insert it into the rear end of the bolt and make sure it aligns with the spring hole in the bolt handle. Then push the spring in and hold it sideways with your thumb so that it doesn't fly back and install the receiver end cap. The receiver end cap should be tightened just enough so that the uh, receiver tube does not vibrate. Do not over tighten the receiver end cap where it will cause the gun gun receiver to be in a bind and the valve will not operate properly. As you can see, there's a, there's a set screw in the top of the receiver which will hold the receiver end cap from vibrating loose. Underneath the set screw is a piece of lead to where 
as it will not damage the threads on the receiver end cap. With that, your gun is completely reassembled and ready to shoot. One problem that we've encountered with guns coming in for repair, uh, they say that the gun does not index properly. Uh, we find that they get dirt behind the clip latch. To remove the clip latch for cleaning, just merely install or insert a drive pin in the, in the bottom of the receiver which, and force the dr drive pin out of the clip latch. Take the clip latch out, being careful not to lose the little spring behind it, and clean the inside of the receiver and the clip latch off, which usually has an accumulation of water or paint or rust, and uh, reinstall it with a little bit of oil, and your gun is ready to go again. This portion of the program is on filling the constant air CO2 cylinder. All CO2 cylinders are only filled approximately two-thirds full. Because it is a refrigerant, they have to allow for the expansion and the contraction of the liquid, which is very affected by temperature. All CO2 cylinders from a 12-gram CO2 cylinder to a 50-pound CO2 cylinder, the pressure is at approximately 780 pounds at room temperature and is very affected by temperature. As the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up, and as the temperature goes down, the pressure goes down. Uh, and all CO2 cylinders have pressure relief valves, as in the pressure relief valve on here. Should the cylinder set in the hot sun for a period of time, uh, the pressure would be so high, it would blow the rupture disc out of the CO2 cylinder before the cylinder would explode. Uh, that's the same purpose for the pressure relief valve on the large cylinders. To fill one of the CO2 cylinders, constant air cylinders, on a Tipman Pneumatics SMG, they all come with a filling adapter. The filling adapters have the standard CO2 threads in both ends. It'll twist on any CO2 cylinder. Just twist it on. You don't even need a wrench. Just twist it on. There's a rubber seal inside here, which will seal between the faces of both cylinders. To fill an empty CO2 cylinder, you just merely twist it on until it seats against the rubber. Open the valve. Wait anywhere from uh, 30 seconds to 45 seconds. It, uh, the time that you wait has nothing to do with it. They must be weighed. On a hot day, the cylinder would fill very fast. On a cold day, the cylinders would fill much slower. But it's a pretty warm day, so we'll try it. Now, this cylinder was warm. In the factory, normally we take them out of a freezer and fill them. But because it is warm, it won't have much CO2 gas in it. So as you can see, at five ounces, it's under by an ounce, so it only has four ounces of CO2 gas in it. So I'll blow it off to chill the tank and reweigh it and refill it. To blow it off, just depress the needle in the end of the cylinder until the gas comes out. As you can see, it's frosted here and it's frosted here. The cylinder gets cold from letting off the pressure. And when we put it back on the second time, it'll fill up to seven ounces. Now, if you were to take your cylinder out of a freezer, you could have eliminated the first operation and the cylinder would have filled right up. As you can see, the frost is leaving the cylinder, which means that it's filling right up with the liquid CO2. These cylinders, being painted red around the top, indicate that this cylinder has a siphon tube that runs down into the liquid on the inside of the cylinder. You must have a CO2 cylinder to fill your own cylinders with a siphon tube. If you do not have a cylinder with a siphon tube, you must operate the cylinder upside down, which is very awkward, and because uh, you must get liquid into the small constant air cylinders. This cylinder should be full right now. And again, we'll weigh it against an empty tank to see that it has seven ounces in it. I'll move the scale to seven ounces. 
okay, because the cylinder was uh, got a little colder than need, it's got eight ounces of CO2 gas in it. Now, to be very safe, you must blow off the CO2, the extra ounce of CO2 gas in it. Blow off approximately an ounce till it's in the safe range of seven ounces. Still a little overfilled. You're better off with six ounces than seven ounces. This has got approximately six and a half, which is ideal. Never any danger of six and a half ounces. There's a lot of danger, not danger, but uh, with seven and a half to eight ounces in your cylinder, you could do a lot of damage to your gun, the seals in the gun, the seals on the end of the tank. Uh, you could possibly on a warm day blow the rupture disc and you're out of the game. So six and a half ounces is way better than seven ounces. Your CO2 cylinder's full. We at Tipman Pneumatics hope that you have benefited from viewing this video presentation. And we hope you have learned what it takes to manufacture and maintain the ultimate paintball gun. For further information, contact Tipman Pneumatics. Call area code 219-422-6448. Thanks for watching.